shall continue with the discussion of limits of functions. Let us quickly recall what we did in the last class. Um, we started with the two metric spaces x d and let us say y rho, those were two metric spaces okay. and we took a subset E of x, okay, E or I do not remember now, it may be A also, okay. subset A of x, not empty subset and P as a limit point of A. L some point in y and we define what is meant by saying that limit of f x as x tends to p is equal to L. Okay, right. okay we give the defi definition in terms of epsilon, delta, etcetera. I will not repeat that definition, but we also proved that saying that the limit exists okay, is equivalent to saying that given any sequence x n in A converging to p, the sequence f x n in y should converge to l okay. and this is equivalent to saying that the limit of f x as x tends to p is equal to l okay, right. And one of the major use of this is to show when the limit does not exist okay. that is suppose you are able to find two sequences x n and y n both converging to p and suppose the limit of f x n and limit of f y n is different then obviously this limit cannot exist okay. We have also seen some examples of that kind. Okay. Let us see a couple of more examples. Uh, let us, for example, this is one of the famous example f x is equal to um, sin 1 by x, okay, sin 1 by x. Okay. And suppose we want to discuss whether, of course, this is not defined at x equal to 0, but it is defined for every uh, x not equal to 0, correct? Okay. It is defined for every real number x which is not 0 okay. and since it is defined for every non 0 x if you take this set A as R minus 0 okay. suppose you take the set A as R minus 0 okay. then 0 is a limit point of this set right. So we can talk of limit of f x as x tends to 0 okay. so we can talk of limit of f x as x tends to 0 okay. But we can talk does not mean that the limit exists, okay, right. So, what we can do is that, for example, to show that the limit does not exist, one can look at the sequences. Uh, for example, let us let us just take the sequence. Suppose I take xn as so let us say 1 by n pi, okay. Suppose I take xn as 1 by n pi, okay. Then what is f of xn? Uh, it, it, this this tends to zero, right? X n as one by n pi that tends to zero, okay? Right? Okay. What is f of x n? It is sin n pi, right? Okay. F of x n is sin n pi. And what is that? For, for every n, it is zero, so it's a constant sequence zero. So this tends to zero. That is fine, okay? Now let us take something else. Suppose I take y n, okay. y n is equal to okay. instead of n pi, let me take something else. Okay. Suppose 1 by let us say 2 n plus 1 pi by 2, let us say. Okay. So that means pi by 2, 5 pi by 2, things like that. Okay. Right. This also tends to 0. Okay, this also turns to 0 okay. and what about f of y n, f of y n, it is sin 2 n plus 1 pi by 2 okay. so that is 1 okay. that is 1 for all n okay. so f of y n is 1 for all n so this turns to 1. Okay. So, we have found two sequences x n and y n both converging to 0, f x n converges to 0, f y n converges to 1. So, limit cannot exist as x goes to 0. Okay. So, this is a simple way of showing that the limit does not exist. Okay. All right. 
when the limit exists okay, then of course first of all you have to have some idea of what that limit should be okay, right. You should have some idea of what that limit should be and then uh, one way is that you can just use this epsilon delta definition and try to show that that is that requirement is satisfied okay. Let us see one example of that type also okay. Let me just make a small modification here. Mm. Suppose I take this g x as this is also one of the famous function okay. So, I will multiply that by x, x sin 1 by x of course for x not equal to 0 okay and we will take the same set A and now let us ask the same question limit of g x as x tends to 0. So, as far as this is concerned, we have shown that this does not exist, okay, and that is the argument there. Okay. Now, when you want to show that the limit exists, okay, first of all, you have to have some idea of what this L should be, okay. Then only you can proceed, okay. All right. In this case, what do you expect? The limit we, we can expect it if at all the limit exists, it has to be zero, okay. So, we should try to show that the limit is uh, limit is 0. Okay. Now, how does one show that the limit is 0? Let us say we just want to use the definition. So, we we shall just take let us say we are given epsilon bigger than 0 okay, okay. and then we want to show that for this epsilon we should want to find a delta that is we want to find delta to find delta bigger than 0 such that what should happen? Uh, whenever mod of x minus 0 is less than delta, okay, whenever mod of x minus 0 is less than delta, this should imply that mod of g x minus 0 should be less than epsilon, okay. okay. Let us just take this last thing mod of g x minus 0, okay. that is same as mod g x, right? mod, mod g x minus 0. This is the thing, but mod x mod x sin 1 by x, okay. And we have already know that mod, uh, mod modulus of a b is same as modulus of a into modulus of b, okay. So, that is same as this mod x into mod uh, sin 1 by x, okay. okay. And now there is one obvious observation here, okay that is this number sin 1 by x mod sin 1 by x is always going to be less than or equal to 1 whatever be x. Okay. So, this is always less than or equal to mod x. Okay. 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 So, what we want is that this mod x should be less than epsilon whenever mod x minus 0 is less than delta. Okay. Now, the choice of delta is obvious. Okay. Okay. We can just take delta is equal to epsilon. Okay, we can just take delta is equal to so. So whenever mod x is less than delta, mod g x minus whenever mod x minus zero is less than delta, mod g x minus zero is less than epsilon. Okay, so that means just take epsilon is equal to delta. Sorry, just take delta is equal to epsilon, and this works. Okay. Okay. Now before proceeding further, let me also take one more very uh, famous example. It is called. Uh, Okay, it is sometimes or some books call it Lebesgue function. You can define on it on any subset of R, but let us say we define it on full R. Okay, f from R to R. Okay, uh, we'll define it f of x. Okay, let me use something else. Let us say suppose I call it h. Okay, so h of x is equal to 1 if x is rational okay if x is rational and 0 otherwise okay 0 otherwise okay now if you take in this case we will be able to show that if you take any x or any any p for that matter, 
the limit of h x as x goes to p does not exist okay. And how does that follow? Okay, let us take for the for the timing let us look at just uh, a p is equal to 0. So, the limit of h x as x tends to 0 let us okay. Okay. Now, as I said we want to set limit does not exist we use our strategy that is find two sequences both converging to 0 okay both converging to 0, but h of x n and h of y n should go to different limits okay. So, that is easy. So, suppose I take let us say x n is equal to 1 by n x n is equal to 1 by n okay that tends to 0 okay. What, what about h of x n? h of x n is 1 right for every n h of x n is 1. So, h of x n is 1. So, that tends to 1 okay all right okay. Let me take another sequence y n. Suppose I take y n as root 2 by n you can take any such sequence okay basically it should be an irrational number okay. So, y okay. So, y n as root 2 by n and so this tends to 0 okay this tends to 0. And what about f of y n? f of y n has to be 0, right? f of y n has to be 0. So, this tends to 0, right? So, again we have two sequences x n and y n both converging to 0, but h x n and sorry, this is h y n. h x n and h y n go to different limits. So, the limit does not exist, okay? And is it clear to you that there is nothing particular about 0 here? If I take any other number, okay, still one can find one sequence of rational numbers converging to it, and another sequence of irrational numbers converging to it, okay, and you can produce a sequence like this. Okay, all right. So this Lebesgue function, limit of h x, does not exist as x goes to p for any p. Okay, limit of h x as x x goes to p doesn't exist for any any value of p. Okay, so let me just write limit x to does not exist does not exist for for whatever bp for every p in r okay. all right now let us see a few special uh, types of functions uh, and certain theorems about those functions and we will see again that uh, we can we shall use the corresponding theorems about the sequences okay and we shall immediately get the conclusions for the theorems about the limits of functions okay so to do that let me we shall take this space y as r okay that is okay let take this space y as r okay and let us say all other things are same i am taking a as a subset of x p as a limit point okay and suppose we consider two functions f and g both from a to r f and g both from a to r and suppose suppose limit of f x as x tends to p is l okay. and limit of g x as x tends to p is let us say some value m. Okay. Of course, remember l and m now are real numbers okay. f x and g x those are real valued functions okay. Their domain may not be r okay. They, they can come from any matrix space okay, but the values are in r. Okay. Once the values are in r we can talk of what is meant by f plus g, f into g, f by g and things like that okay. And what we want to say is that if the limit of f x is l and limit of g x is m, then limit of f plus g as x goes to okay that is uh, that is l plus m etcetera okay. So, that is the theorem okay. So, okay. then first thing yeah by the way this whole symbol means when I say limit of f x as x tends to p is equal to l, it means that the limit exists okay and it is equal to l okay right. Similarly here okay 
so otherwise we do not write this equal to anything okay. So, so what I want to say is that limit of f x plus g x or f plus g x okay, you can say whatever it is limit of f x plus g x as x tends to p this is equal to l plus m okay. Second thing is limit of f x into g x as x tends to p is l into m okay and finally if this m is not zero if this m is not zero then we can talk of limit of fx by gx as x tends to p and that should be l divided by m okay see if m is not zero okay uh, limit of f x by g x as x tends to p is l by m. Okay. Mm. Again I will say that we shall not spend any time in proving this just use the corresponding theorems about the sequences. Okay. Let us just see what is what is the meaning of this. Okay. We have said that this means that whenever it, you take any sequence of elements in A, let us say x n, whenever x n in A converges to the point P, f x n should converge to L and g x n should converge to M, right. Then f of x n plus g of x n should converge to L plus M, right. That is what about the sequence, we, we know that the sequence f x n converges to L and sequence g x n converges to L and about the sequences we already proved, okay, that the limit of the sum sequence is same as the sum of the limits. So, f of x n plus g of x n should converge to L plus m. Similarly, f x n into g x n should converge to L into m. Okay. So, no new concept is involved okay. and similarly, if m is not equal to 0, then f x n divided by g x n should converge to L by m. Okay. Now, you may wonder that uh, not only m not equal to 0, to in order to talk about f x by g x, this g x also should be different from 0, okay. but we need not uh, uh, say that specifically because see the what we are bothered about is only about the values of x near the point p okay and if m is not equal to 0 and if g x tends to g x n tends to m then for large values of n g x n will be different from 0 okay right. So, f x n by g x n or f x by g x will be defined well defined for x close to p okay if m is different from 0. Okay. So, as I said all this theorem follows by corresponding theorem about the sequences and our equivalent theorem about the uh, limit of a function and the limit of a sequence. Okay. Okay. Now, let us go to the next concept which in certain way depends on the limit and it is that of continuity. continuity. Again here also we shall take these two metric spaces as it is x let us say x d and y rho metric spaces okay and again we will take a non empty set A in x and f is a function from A to y, f is a function from A to y and this time we will take this point p not a, not as a limit point of a, but p as a point of a okay. p belongs to a that means the function must be defined at that point a okay. and then we shall define what is meant by saying that f is continuous at p. Okay. So, f is said to be continuous at p. continuous at p in A. If the definition is again very similar to the corresponding definition of the limits, if for every epsilon bigger than 0 there exists delta bigger than 0 such that for every x in A, uh, 
if distance between x and p is less than delta, distance between f x and f p should be less than epsilon. Okay. So, distance between x and p less than delta, distance between x and p less than delta, this implies distance between, okay, this in since the f x and f p those are going to be in y, there the distance is rho. So, rho f x f p is less than epsilon. If f is continuous at every point in A, we say that f is continuous on A or in A. Okay. So, f is said to be continuous on A, continuous on A or some books also use in A. Okay. That is a, that's a minor point. Okay. If If f is continuous at every point in A, you can realize that uh, this definition of continuity and the definition of limit, okay, they are very closely related to each other, okay. but there are some differences. One difference is that while talking about the limit, this point P need not belong to A, okay. the point P need not belong to A, it has to be, if it is enough, it is just a limit point. Okay. Whereas, for talking about the continuity, the point P must be a point of A, okay. point P must be a point of A and since it is a point of A, we can talk of what is f of P. Okay. In case of limit, there is no such thing as f of P. Okay f of p may not be defined at all. Okay. That is the first thing. Secondly, once uh, if p belongs to A, p may or may not be limit point. Okay. p may or may not be limit point, but suppose p is a limit point. Okay. Suppose p is a limit point, then you can say that this is same as saying that limit of f x as x tends to p, it is same as f p. Okay. Right. Because after all, this is the definition of limit. Uh, in, in, in this, if I take it as L, okay, it will mean that limit of f x as x tends to p is equal to l. Okay. So, if p is a limit point, then saying that the function is continuous at p, it is same as saying that limit of f x as x tends to p is equal to f p. Okay. If p is not limit point, then what? Suppose p belongs to A, but p is not a limit point. Remember, we had called such a point as isolated point. Okay. p is not a limit point means what? there exists some some open ball containing p which contains no other point of a okay only only that point p okay but in that case we can say that uh, in that case we can say that uh, whatever epsilon is given okay whatever epsilon is given suppose so Suppose there is uh, suppose p is an isolated point. Okay, suppose p is an isolated point. Essentially, what I want to say is that if p is an isolated point, then the function is always continuous at that point. Okay, so let us just make that observation. Okay, if if p is an isolated point of A, if p is an isolated point of A. then f is continuous at p. Okay. Now, how does this follow? Okay. Let us just see. So, since if p is isolated point, what should happen is that there should exist a ball with center at p, which contains no other point of A. Okay. 
let us uh, so we can say that since since p is isolated there exists suppose i call radius of that ball as delta suppose i take the radius of that ball as delta there exists delta bigger than 0 such that uh, open ball with center at p and radius delta its intersection with a its intersection with a must be singleton p right because it contains no other point of a it can it contains no other point of a okay intersection a must be singleton p okay okay right now is it clear to you from this that if i see what this says is that for every epsilon there should exist some delta such that whenever you take any point x in a and if it, if the distance between x and p is less than delta okay then distance between f x and f p should be less than epsilon okay but if i take this delta for example if i take take this delta then only x in a which will uh, which will satisfy this is p okay and in which case f x and f p distance between f x and f p will be zero so whatever epsilon you take whatever epsilon you take this delta will work okay, okay. because this inequality distance between x and p less than delta that is satisfied only by p okay only by p and no other no other point because there is no other point near near x okay so there is no other point near p okay, okay. so if p is an isolated point then f is continuous at p okay, right so in particular for example if your set a is such that every point is isolated okay then the function will be continuous at that point okay for example suppose a is n the set of all natural numbers okay then every point is isolated point there okay so any function defined on n will be continuous function right okay okay next is suppose oh, so so let us so that disposes the case of the isolated points okay let us now look at what if if it is not an isolated point it must be a limit point okay in case of limit point what should happen is that limit f is continuous at p then the limit of fx as x tends to p should be same as fp that is what this second require this requir definition says okay so if p is a limit point if p is a limit point of a then f is continuous at p f is continuous at p if and only if or this is equal to say that limit of f x as x tends to p is equal to f of okay okay so let us again and of course this does not need any other proof because this this sentence limit of fx as x tends to p is equal to fp is basically same as what we have written here okay right this is basically same as what we have written here okay all right so let us again take the summary suppose p see in order to talk about the continuity we have to have that p must belong to a okay since p once p belongs to a p can be either an isolated point of a or a limit point of a there is no third possibility okay if p is an isolated point of a f is always continuous there okay if p is a limit point of a then limit of fx as x tends to p must be same as fp that is the requirement for continuity okay, okay. so now suppose let us ask this question what is the what is the way in which f can fail to be continuous okay of course let us let us forget about the case when p does not belong to a. if f is not defined at p obviously we cannot talk about the continuity at all okay but suppose that is not the case suppose p belongs to a okay if p is isolated point obviously there is no question of f failing to be continuous okay so if at all f can fail to be continuous it ha will happen only at a limit point okay and in what way it will happen there are two ways okay either that this limit does not exist at all okay either that this limit does not exist at all or that this limit exists but its value is different from this okay 
So, okay. So let us again summarize. What are the ways of in which a function can fail to be continuous? First of all, it can fail to be continuous only at limit points. Okay. It can never fail to be continuous at isolated points. Okay. There are two ways in which this can happen. One is that limit of f x as x tends to p does not exist, that is one way. Secondly, limit exists, but it is different from f of p, okay. it is different from f of p. Okay. Now, among these two types, you can see that the second type is easy to handle. Okay. Okay. Suppose the limit exists and the value is different from f of p, then we can say that we can redefine that function okay, and change the value of f at p okay, and make the function continuous there. Okay that is possible. Okay. So, that is why that kind of uh, discontinuity okay, that if a function is not continuous at a point, we say it is discontinuous at that point and those points are called points of discontinuity of function. Okay. And this, this second type which I mentioned just now that is called removable discontinuity okay. and the reason is obvious because that discontinuity you can remove by simply modifying the definition of a function at that point. Okay. But if the limit does not exist at all, then you can do nothing. Okay. Whatever way you modify the definition of f at the point p, still the function will remain discontinuous there. Okay. Okay. You can see one more thing here that though in giving this definition here, we have said that uh, function is defined at a and then we p belongs to a etcetera etcetera. You can see that in all this definition and whatever discussion we have done so far. Okay. Uh, complement of a has no importance at all right whatever happens to the points outside a we are not bothered at all okay, right so here afterwards we can simply forget about those points and talk of function going from x to y okay that is i just regard this a itself as a matrix space okay i will regard this a itself as a matrix space and talk about the functions going from a to y or which is same as saying x to y okay right and we shall now give a very useful criteria for the continuous functions okay and let us say that now this time i am going to talk about function which is continuous everywhere okay of course we can also give a similar description for the function which is continuous at a point but it unnecessarily complicates the thing so let us let us talk of this okay and that is in terms of open sets okay. as we know open set is a very important concept in matrix spaces okay and if we can talk of something purely in terms of open sets then that concept can be translated to topological spaces also okay because you know that we have defined what is meant by a topological space in a topological space there is no concept of distance okay but you have a concept of open sets okay now here we have given a concept of continuity first using distance okay but suppose it is possible to give that definition using only open sets then we can talk of functions continuous in topological spaces also okay that is the idea okay uh, so let us let us take that first okay so i'll write that as a theorem okay and also it is useful because using this equivalent criteria certain other proofs also become simpler okay okay so let us again say that uh, x li uh, y rho are matrix spaces and f from x to y is a function okay f from x to y is continuous okay 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 this time i shall write continuous on x okay. but this is one convention okay suppose suppose nothing is said if a function is continuous at a point we should say continuous at that point but suppose nothing is said simply said f, f is continuous then it it is assumed that it is continuous on x that means it is continuous at every points of x okay so f is continuous on x if and only if this is interesting what it says is that if you take an open set in y okay and look at its inverse image in x then that should also be open in x okay that is f is continuous if and only if inverse image of every open set is open okay right so if and only if uh, f inverse g is open in x for every open set g in y okay 
in other words this means that if g is an open set in y f inverse g is open set in x okay. all right let us see how we can prove this okay okay now we can observe one more thing even before going to the proof of this okay coming back to this uh, discussion of this continuity here you can say that saying that this d x p less than delta this is same as saying that x belongs to the open ball with center at p and radius delta right this last thing means so this means x belongs to open ball with center at p and radius delta right okay and what does this mean this means f p uh, f x belongs to this means f x belongs to the open ball with center at f p and radius epsilon right so so this means f x belongs to open ball with center at f p and radius epsilon okay Okay, that is what does it mean that whenever x is in this ball, f x is in that ball. Okay. Is it same as saying that the image of this ball, that is f of this whole ball, is inside this ball? Okay, right, right. So this this last sentence, so this whole sentence, whatever we have written here, that can be simply like this: f of u p delta is contained in u f p epsilon. So, saying that f is continuous at limit point means for every epsilon there should exist a delta such that f of that open ball with center at p and radius delta should be contained in open ball with center at f p and radius epsilon. Okay. We shall make use of this in the in this proof okay. all right. In order to prove this okay, let us let us first use this way suppose suppose f is continuous okay. suppose f is continuous. Okay then we want to uh, say that if g is open in uh, y f inverse g must be open in x okay so suppose uh, suppose f is continuous suppose f is continuous on x and g is open in y okay we want to prove that f inverse g is open in x okay that is this is what we want to prove to prove f inverse g is open in x okay right of course if f inverse g is open there is nothing to be proved okay right if f inverse this is this is trivial okay so this is true if so true if f inverse g is empty what is the meaning of saying that f inverse g is empty that means no f x goes to g okay that is no point in x its image is in g okay. so that is the meaning of saying that f inverse g is empty in that case nothing to be proved okay so next assume that suppose f inverse g is non empty suppose f inverse g is non empty It's non-empty means what? Some point belongs to it. Okay. Suppose f inverse g is non-empty, and let suppose I take that let p belong to f inverse of g. Okay. Then we must show that p is a interior point. Okay. That means there should exist. We should show that there exists a ball with center at p and some positive radius such that that ball is completely inside f inverse g. Okay. But p belongs to f inverse g means what? It means f of p is in g, right? Okay. So this means this means f of p is in g, right? Okay. But this is an open set. Okay. This is an open set. So there must exist some ball with this as a center, which is completely contained. Okay. Suppose I call that radius of that ball as epsilon. Okay. 
So, so this implies there exists epsilon bigger than 0 such that open ball with center at f t and radius epsilon is contained in G. Now we have assumed that f is continuous, right? We assume that f is continuous at every point. So in particular, at the point p also. Okay? So for this epsilon, there should exist some delta such that whatever we written should happen. Okay? So uh, since f is continuous, since f is continuous at p, there exists delta bigger than zero. Such that such that let me such that distance between x and p less than delta implies distance between fx and fp less than epsilon. Okay, and we is, we have seen that that means this last. Okay, that means oh, whenever x belongs to u p delta, fx belongs to u f p epsilon, or which is same as saying that there exists delta bigger than 0 such that I will write this f of u p delta this is contained in u f p epsilon. Okay. And this is contained in G, okay. u f p epsilon is contained in G. Okay. Now, so what we have proved that f of this open ball, f of this open ball is in G. Okay. So does this mean that this open ball is in f inverse G? Okay. Because what we have proved that if you take any point in this ball, if you take any x in this ball, f x is in G. Okay. Right. So that means this ball is contained in the inverse image of G. Right. So this implies u p delta is contained in f inverse G. Now that means that p is an interior point, right? That means that p is an interior point, and we have showed that every point p is an interior point. Okay, so that shows that f inverse G is open, right? Okay, so therefore, f inverse G is open. Is it clear? So we have shown that if G is an open set, then f inverse G is also an open set. Okay? This should happen if f is continuous on x. Okay. Now we want to show that the converse is also true. Okay. All right. So let us take it this way. Now assume that the function f has the property that whenever g is open in y, f inverse g is open in x. Okay. Right. Okay. All right. Then we want to show that f is continuous on x. Okay. To show that f is continuous on x means what? We must show that f is continuous at every point in x. Okay. That is, so let let us take any point. Suppose I call that point P. So let P belong to x. And let us take epsilon bigger than zero. Okay. Let P belong to x and epsilon bigger than and to show that f is continuous at P. For this epsilon, we have to find some delta. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Now, see this uh, u f p epsilon. U f p epsilon is an open set in Y, right? Okay. Open ball with center at f p and radius epsilon. This is open in Y. Okay. So its inverse image must be open in X. Okay. That is what we have assumed. If you take any open set in Y, its inverse image must be an open set in X. Okay. So therefore, we say that f inverse, f inverse of that okay, u f p epsilon is open in X. Okay. Okay. 
Now, does P belong to this set? It does because uh, f of that is f p, okay, f of that is f p, and it is it is in this pole, so it certainly belongs to so. Okay, and p belongs to f inverse u f p epsilon. Okay, see, remember this simply means that f of p belongs to this pole, right? That is true. Okay. Okay. Whenever you said p belongs to f inverse of any set, it simply means that f of p belongs to that set. Okay. And what is that set? It is nothing but the open ball with center at f p. Okay. So obviously f of p belongs to that. Okay. All right. Now p belongs to this set and it is open. So what does that mean? It again it should mean that there exists some positive number such that open ball with that p as a center and that positive number is completely inside this. Okay, right. So let us call that positive number as delta. Okay, so therefore there exists delta bigger than zero, such that open ball with center at p and radius delta is contained in this f inverse of f inverse of u f p epsilon. Okay, and this is same as saying that f of u p delta is contained in u f p epsilon. Okay, right. and that this is this means that whenever distance between x and p is less than delta. Okay, distance between f and p is less than delta. Distance between f x and f p is less than epsilon. Right? Okay, that is that is same as saying that f is continuous at p, and since p was any arbitrary point in x, f is continuous everywhere in x. Okay, all right. So as I said, this describes the continuity completely in terms of open sets. Right? If you look at this, this has nothing to do with the distance. Of course, in metric spaces, open sets are defined in terms of distance. That is okay. But suppose you have some idea of defining open sets without using the distance, then in that kind of spaces you can talk of what is meant by a continuous function by simply taking this as the definition, okay? And that is what is done in topological spaces, okay? And that is what you will learn in your course in topology. Okay? Now let us see how these things make certain proofs also quite simple, okay? Like for example, now we have taken a function f from x to y, okay? Suppose that is a continuous function. And let us say we okay. Let me just write that also as another theorem. Again, a fairly well-known theorem. Suppose this time I take say three metric spaces. Let us say x d y rho, x d y rho, and let us say z. Okay. Let us say some metric eta here. Okay. Or metric spaces. Actually, see, remember. Let me also say one more thing here. When it is understood which metric you are talking about, or whether the particular reference to metric is not important, one simply says x is a metric space. Okay, right? X is a metric space, or y is a metric space. Strictly speaking, one should say x d is a metric space. But if it is understood which metric you are taking, or if the actual reference to the metric is not important for discussion then it is quite customary to say that x is a metric space so similarly i should have simply said x y z are metric spaces okay and suppose uh, f from x to y suppose f from x to y and g from y to z are continuous Then we can think of a function which goes from x to z, which is a composition of these two functions. Okay, so define h from x to z by h of x is equal to g of f of x. Okay, g of f of x.
okay, g of f of x, okay, or which is usually denote denote as this is simply usually described as h is equal to g compose with f, okay, okay, then h is continuous. Okay, that is what we want to say. Then h is continuous. In short, what we want to say is that the composition of two continuous functions is again a continuous function. Okay. Okay. And instead of writing the proof in its detail, I will just give you an idea and then we shall stop with that. Okay. See the idea is simply this, we shall use this criteria, we shall use this criteria to show that the function is continuous. Okay. We want to say that h is continuous, so h goes from x to z, okay. h goes from x to z. So, it is sufficient to show that if I take some open set in z, then show that it is inverse image in x is open in x, right. So, I think it is better to explain this with the diagram. X, see f goes from x to y and g goes from y to z, okay. We are taking, let us say we take some open set, we take some open set g in z, okay. We want to say that h, now this composition is nothing but h right this g composed with f is nothing but h. Now what we want to say is that uh, h inverse of g which will be a set in x okay that is open that is open. But what is the argument this g inverse of g is open in y okay then f inverse of the g inverse of g is open in x okay because f and g both are continuous. But then all that you need to observe is that that set is nothing but same as h inverse g okay. In other words, what you have to observe is simply this h inverse of g is f inverse of g inverse of g, okay, right. And if, if g is open here, since g is continuous, small g is continuous, g inverse g is open in y, and since f is continuous, f inverse of this is open in x, and that is same as h inverse of g. Now, this is nothing but elementary set theory, okay, because h since if h is defined like this you can easily show that h inverse is nothing but f inverse composed with if h is g composed with f h inverse is f inverse composed with g inverse okay that is fairly an elementary set theory okay and so using that and this theorem we can show that the composition of two continuous functions is also continuous okay it can also be proved by using the usual epsilon delta definition okay and i suggest to you that you take that as an exercise okay try to prove it also without using this criteria and you will you will understand a difference. We will stop with that. Okay.